Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. Hello, friends. Kirk Henderson and Josh Bo coming to you for another episode of Mavs Moneyball After Dark. It's about 9.15 on December 1st. And let me tell you, 9.15, fucking cool. Because that means we're going to be able to do other stuff after Mavs stuff. How you doing, Josh? <laughs> I'm I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm a little tired. I got the booster yesterday, so I'm I'm feeling the uh, the after effects. But uh, I mean, hey, it makes things easier when the Mavericks play a game that ends before nine thirty and they win by almost forty, which uh, let's just say is a sight for sore eyes for one thirty nine. One thirty nine to one hundred seven, and there have been many games this season where the Mavericks could not score. 25 points in three six three quarters of the game tonight they did not score under 25 points in a single quarter it was per brad townsend of of you know dallas morning news he says the mavericks 68.7 percent shooting from the floor tonight was the highest in franchise history the previous best was 67.7 against the san diego clippers in 1983 which was before I was born. So we Ooh. just we just witnessed like actual Mavericks history. Um and and you know, I, I wanna let's really just stay with with the high marks for a little bit. Cause it was it, you know, it's a sort of game we've been wondering if they were gonna have a like a preposterous shooting regression game. And and that like let's be clear, that was it. They shot 70% from the floor. Um, but I don't think that was what we were expecting. Like we were expecting them to hit like 55% of shots, you know, maybe go, you know, like it just is is ridiculous. Like I, I don't recall seeing a thing like that where everyone hits at the same time. And I was having a discussion during it was like five o'clock today with somebody about how, you know, and, and if any of you are really into the data, the Mavericks quality of shot attempts are among the best in the league with what they've been getting. It's that their actual shooting is, has been really bad. And so at a certain point, something was going to click. Now I don't like, obviously shooting like this is sustainable. Who cares? I don't care about any of that right now. I had a lot of fun watching that game. And you need some, sometimes you need a game like that to wash the taste out of your mouth. I mean, it was, there's, there's really not a, I just like why, like Luca had 28, 14 and four and was just having a ball. Porzingis <laughs> had one of the more just quite like, like he shut down, he helped shut down Jonas Valanciunas, who was on just riding a preposterous hot streak. And was, you know, get scoring at the rim, making really nice, easy passes. You know, one day his three-pointers are going to come back because he the man just can't shoot the three this year. It's pretty rough. Who cares, though? Because they're went like they're they're you know, like this regression will 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 work out eventually. Like, I don't know how good the Mavericks are. The, those last two games are just really brutal, but a win like this really it was what they needed. 
Um, and we talked about that. We, you know, that they, we they're playing the Pelicans again on Friday, and unless like Zion shows up, they're gonna get the shit kicked out of them then too, unless the Mavericks <laughs> absolutely fall apart. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought up Porzingis because I w- the thing that I noticed, I think they're like the two. You know, there were like, I mean, there's a there's dozens of like really nice things to take away from this game. Obviously, when you win by you know this many points uh, and you shoot damn near seventy percent for an entire game, uh, we talked about this after the Cavaliers game and Kristaps spraining his ankle, and we were very concerned because we knew that like if if that injury was you know any if it was giving him any type of trouble in the ensuing couple of days, we knew that the Mavericks were probably going to be cautious and sit him because you cannot roll out a guy with bad knees on a, on a shaky ankle. So the fact that he was able to play tonight meant that obviously it wasn't a serious sprain. And the fact that he was able to look so great. Like, I mean, uh-huh. I think uh-huh. both of us were a little concerned, like, Oh man, are that, you know, is he going to look off because his ankles bothering him? And you know, the ankle is the ankle and the knees or, or are all both on the leg, you know, is it going to, is both it going to be an awkward night? Explosive. Like yeah, it wasn't great. Yeah. Like that's always been the thing for me when he looks so tentative when he's, when he's playing injured and there was nothing about tonight's game that was tentative. Like there were, he and Luca hooked up on at least five different really like just Holy shit kind of plays uh, rim running type stuff. And, I know I don't mean this pithy, but using the seven three athletic guy as a rim runner, it's neat. <laughs> they should do it more. And and I really mean this in all seriousness. Porzingis dunked two or three times where he landed on both feet. And I just that's been my bugaboo for years because he's a huge person putting lots of force on his body. And when he's doing that, he's distributing it equally. Like um, Brown got a technical foul at the end of the game. Moses Brown did for a hilarious dunk because he hung on the rim and popped off and landed on two feet. And my thing for the NBA for years has been every single person that dunks with force and swings under should be allowed to hang and regain their balance before landing. Like that should not be a technical. Now, maybe what Moses did probably a technical because <laughs> he screamed like a lunatic. But you know what I mean? Like there's yeah, just, yeah. just like like you needed a game. We needed to see a game from the Mavericks. It's game 20. And this was the second game that comes to mind where they really, really kicked the crap out of someone. Now it's equally funny that the previous game was also the Pelicans. Um, <laughs> the Pelicans are, are not a now, good team, but you well, can. I mean, the Mavericks are now 6 and 0 in division. And that matters. That matters for this playoff seeding stuff. Yeah. And uh, it helps that the their division is kind of a tire fire right now mm. with the uh, Pelicans, Spurs, and Rockets. Uh, Memphis and without Jaw. And Memphis, they're kind of like the Mavs. I, mean, I don't know if, I mean, I don't want to talk about Memphis too much, but they're also one of those. How is their record what it is because their point differential is terrible? Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, they're, they've got their struggles. So, uh, I mean, nothing the Mavericks can do. They got, you know, you can't wash away – I mean, you, you can only do so much to wash away those two previous losses. You can't get it all back. You can't get – you know, one win can't count for two wins no matter how bad you beat a team. But, I mean, they just – you, you got to still play the game and you still got to come out. And you. this is the best that they could – you know, this is the best possible result that they could have, you know, despite the fact that those last two games probably, you know – still in the back of my mind at least in terms of trying to evaluate this team you know you just you can't deny that this was an overwhelmingly positive and and joyous win which has been few and far between uh i think you know this felt kind of like that mexico city game in the 2019 Mm. 2020 season where luke and kp just it just fell all into place like there was no awkwardness there were it, it just I haven't seen the team look this kind of free in a while. And even, you know, when they're playing well last season, you know, there were still parts of that season that were a little sluggish too. So uh, this was fun. I mean, literally everyone on the roster, uh, almost everyone scored except for, you know, Eugene and uh, Jordan McLaughlin or yeah. Eugene had a, had a awesome pass to, to, you know, just some nice play in a few seconds of time. Um, We've not even talked about, probably the most moving forward, the most tactically interesting thing that happened in the game. I don't know if it will happen again. Uh, We saw a, a reversion to the initial lineup to start the year with the exception of Reggie Bullock replacing Tim Hardaway Jr. And 
I don't know if this is a an instance of kind of you know just the fact that everybody was on a roll or if it's something to look at but Reggie Bullock started the game the way the game started for the Mavericks has was significantly different than what's been happening like they got up 5-0 and just looked you know the the Pelicans sort of stormed back before Luca went nuts but you know Bullock was involved the spacing um I have nothing to back this up 10 minutes after the game but the spacing felt much better I don't know why that is um it was Bullock was two of three from three point land. And, uh, you know, he's been so terrible shooting and not like, I want to almost say was, was he in the twenties before tonight? Like it was, I think it was, it was like bad. 28%. Yeah. It was bad. And then Tim Hardaway came off the bench who, if we're honest, Tim was also pretty chunky for most of the game and then hit a couple of catch and shoot threes. Uh, and, and this is something I think we should look into. Someone made the, the, observation of i think tim is taking more shots off the dribble this year which really harkened back to new york knicks atlanta hawks tim hardaway because like it's not that he can't play off the dribble it's just they had cut the inefficient stuff out of his game and i think he has been leaning into more inefficient looks and against you know the the pelicans tonight it i saw at least three shots that were like either no dribble or one dribble pull-ups like not moves just sort of like the sort of things he excelled at last year. And I, I'm, I'm hopeful for that because he had he had played – there's really no other way to phrase it. He had been terrible for like seven straight games. Yeah. Uh, I think the big difference – you know, when the starting lineup change got announced, I think people were kind of like, wait, what? Because like what has Bullock done? I mean, Bullock mm-hmm. made two three-pointers tonight, and uh, that's, the, that's the amount of three-pointers he made total in the last two weeks. Mm-hmm. Two, he made two – he's made two three-pointers – last two weeks before entering tonight. I mean, he, he was in, you know, they were both in bad slumps and I'm wondering if the logic was, okay, well, when Tim is bad on offense, he is a huge negative because let's be honest, you know, his defense is just not, he's not a good defender. Yeah, uh, He's, you know, maybe he has his moments taking charges and, and, and maybe he's playing some one-on-one situations, but over the course of a game, he is just a, a lousy off ball defender and team defender, you know, playing within a, a system. It's just, it's just bad. So when he's not making shots, he's a huge negative. And I wonder if the coaching staff was like, all right, well, if if it's between Bullock and Tim Hardaway and they're, none of them are making shots, at least, you know, Bullock is a superior defender. So I wonder if that was the thinking, like, okay, even if even if they're not going to hit shots, at least let's get another defender in that starting lineup next to Luka uh, and have, you know, you've got Dorian, Reggie, and Kristaps. So presumably you have three above average defenders on the floor, which the Mavericks – don't have a lot of times because they've got a lot of one-way guys so i wonder if that was the logic and then of course maybe uh they're looking at the same data we are and reggie bullock apparently when the calendar hits december 1st he turns into ray allen like our staffer matthew wrote earlier today his october november career shooting splits for from three are hilarious i think he's like a career 28 percent shooter in october november and then the rest of the year he's uh incredible so Maybe that's going to happen again. Um, Tim playing off the bench helps. You know, when you got Brunson and Tim off the bench, that's like, that's really nice. I think something that's under the radar is despite the fact that Brunson's been so good, I think entering tonight, the Mavericks were like 25th in bench scoring, um, (laughs) which is kind of crazy when you think about how good Brunson's been. But they Mm -hmm. get the bench has been nothing outside of Brunson um, in terms of offensive productivity. And usually with the bench, that's kind of what you want, right? You just want some guys that can make shots and hold, hold, you know, hold things down until the starters come back in. So mm-hmm. I, I like the THJ, you know, Brunson bench lineup. I like uh, what that does for that unit. And you theoretically, you're not losing too much offensively by putting Bullock in there. And if he continues his career trends, I mean, he's going to start making shots. And I think this lineup will, will be here to stay. Well, so the funny part was, and and I, ended up being right about this and I'm never right about this kind of stuff where it's like Powell was back in the lineup and everyone was like, Oh no, why Dwight Powell? But Powell only played 11 minutes, which he got to start in the first quarter. He got to start in the third quarter. Then was never seen from again. <laughs> you know, Powell in 15 minutes or less is fine. It's when you get into the twenties that things just start to go sideways. I do have a question for you because we're going to see calls about this. Do the Mavericks need to use Boban a little more strategically? Because his per points per minute are just hilarious. Like he's 
he's scoring all, you know, every time he gets the game, but we all, and we've talked about this and our listeners know this. Um, he just, you know, the game becomes about Boban when he's in the game, but should they try to use him for like a Boban spurt every, you know, six or eight minutes every game? Or is that ridiculous? I don't think it's ridiculous. I think with Willie, Col- I think the fact that everyone, every other big on the floor, you know, has had weird stretches of, unproductiveness you know, I mean, that's you know nice. max, max, no, every other big has sucked and i'm tired of watching them <laughs> yeah so i mean eventually you gotta you gotta go to something else i think obviously he can't play more than what he played tonight and i know people get really mad about that i think i had someone i went had a back and forth with him wondering like boban is so productive why doesn't he play more and it's like he's just he's seven three almost 300 pounds like the human body has limits on the basketball court uh so but but what he did tonight was fine um but also, you know, you know, what he did against Cleveland was not bad either. But he had 10 points in eight minutes, and he had six points in three minutes against the, the Clippers. I don't think he played against the Wizards. So, I mean, it's worth a sh- – I mean, why not, right? I mean, it's worth a shot to see if this can continue. Obviously, there are going to be some nights where it just might not look good. You know, I don't and know. And you pull it gonna... immediately. Right. And that's okay. Like, you give him two, three shot attempts, and if it's not working, you pull him out. It's just – the kind of stuff we've been seeing with these other guys, I'm just, yeah, Powell was three of three. That's because Luca was like dishing to him. It's it's not, you know, Cleva's only played 16 minutes, which I think is going to be, he's just going to work himself back into shape. Like there's just an, until or if they ever make a trade, which I, I, I'm, I need to talk about that offline <laughs> after Xavier wrote his uh, hilarious, Xavier wrote a piece, which we're going to publish at some point, but it's, the 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 trade options for the Mavericks are not as easy as we like to act like they are. Um, and and I just if they ever go get a big, because I think big, I think we're all kind of in agreement that finding a big is going to be easier than finding a ball handler. I don't necessarily know if one is more important than the other with what the needs of the Mavericks are. But I, anyways, that's that's a different discussion. But right. this but, was this was just it was it was a nice game. Um. Luca you know, was five of five at the rim. Yes, Luke, and I mean, was that was huge at the rim. Yeah. I think is <laughs> it. You know, some of these, some of these at the rim, you know, shots that he's getting lately are like floaters over people. Like there were uncontested layups at the rim, and yeah. there were, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. I think you made the point. Uh, I think Luca had a nice, un, somewhat uncontested layup after a dribble handoff with Kristaps. And I think, you know, that was something that I wrote about. I can't remember if it was last week or the week before that. Think, yeah, last week during Thanksgiving week. And why not, man? I mean, the handoff has always been a really good play for Luca. I think it's a really good play for a lot of this roster because I think you made the point like, hey, so many of these guys are one-dimensional and, and can't dribble. So why don't you do things where you limit how much they have to dribble? And when you have a dribble, I know it's a dribble handoff, but when you've got a – You've got a guy, a bunch of guys that can't really dribble, but you know, give them a head of steam, give them a, give them a runway, let them catch the ball on the move, so that they're not trying to create something out of nothing or inviting, you know, an easier trap in the pick and roll when you're trying to set that up because sometimes those plays can be slow developing. Like, I really like the quick hitting, play the handoff plays, and I think it benefits a lot of a lot of the skill sets of the Mavericks roster, and it helps Luca. I think you know. God, anything that can get him from not having to pound the ball into the court for for 17 seconds or 18 seconds a, a possession is a win. Just making things seem somewhat easier for him. And Kristaps is good. Like he's scoring, like you know, at the rate he's scoring and the way he's playing the last two or three weeks, uh, he's much more. He's the most like you know, out of all the Mavericks big men, you know, if he touches the ball at the elbow, you know, defenses are starting to react to that now because he's a threat because he's mm-hmm. been playing so well. So. I think that, you know, changes things up. It's it's much different when Dwight Powell has the ball at the free throw line extended or the nail compared to if Kristaps has the ball, like in terms of how the defense is going to react. So, you know, just milk that uh, as much as they can. It's I, I really like seeing it. I wonder if Porzingis recognizes the difference in the kind of shots he's getting. Um, the kind of looks he's getting are easy. And... The wonderful part about a small like about basketball when it's designed well and then executed well is it's supposed to be easy. And I think there are certain kinds of players in in how basketball was played in the early 2000s and late 90s where there was just an emphasis on 
you know, doing shit that was hard. And I love seeing Porzingis dunk and make layups. And then, you know, like I said earlier, his threes are going to come around. He is mowing guys down and I need to go find, like it's been long enough. Hopefully the stats will have updated by now. Porzingis is sh- <laughs> he's shooting <laughs> 31% from three point. And he's a career 36% guy. Like, that's going to swing at some point. Like, it's, he's just going to have, like, a stretch where he's shooting 50% from three. And when that happens, that opens up in a completely different dimension of the Mavericks offense. Yeah, totally. But in the meantime, uh, he was 6-6 six of six at the rim tonight. Six of his nine makes at the, at the rim. So, just keep doing that. A uh, lot of good pick and roll with Luca. I mean, it just... It helps to play the Pelicans and it helps to play a Pelicans team. You know, the Pelicans aren't just a bad, bad team, but it's also nice that they're like really on that. They're, you know, the Mavericks get out athleted a lot in their losses. Mm. This is not a team that can out athlete the, the Mavericks. Uh, it's funny it though. I, I, I find it, you know, I find myself really liking a lot of their players, like really liking a lot of their players. Like, Ingram's an interesting guy, like seems to be the the penultimate good stats, bad team guy. Um, but I still love his game because he's so he at least offensively. Nikhil Alexander Walker strikes me if if Carlisle were still the head coach, like that's the guy who would like milk Nikhil Alexander Walker into, you know, a $12 million a year contract. Who knows? Anyways, there's just <laughs> I, I, that's one of the things about seeing multi, like teams like this multiple times early in the year. It's there's just guys that you wonder, and you know, we've been talking about that a lot, Mavs social media, where I think a lot of us are just sort of like sick of the same dudes. Um, and when you watch other guys, like, oh, I wonder how he'd do next to Luca. But that's what was so nice about seeing some of these guys hit shots, because it's like, yeah, Luca had eight turnovers because he was getting a little cute with stuff, but he <laughs> wants to make the pass to the open dude. Give him a reason to, you know? Yeah. And what? Everyone in the starting lineup besides Pal hit a three. Uh, it's really funny looking at the box score though. They only had, you know, if a team scores 139 points, you assume there's going to be a lot of guys in double figures. The Mavericks mm-hmm. had four guys in double fi- in double digits. Uh, well, let me read you some more stats. Still, yeah, because yeah, this ahead. is incredible. Andrew Lopez, um, I want to say he's also Dallas Morning News, said that the Dallas Mavericks tonight shot, you know, new team record, which we we covered 68.7 percent, shot 79.6 percent on twos, also a new team record. That percentage is the third best mark in the shot clock era in NBA history. Oh my God. (laughs) 79.6% again on two pointers would be the highest with a minimum of 42 pointers. (laughs) Good Lord. (laughs) So it's like, this is great. It's, it's one of these silly things. Like, do you remember, um, you, and this was before we were podcasting, but we were, we were both writing about his money ball. Do you remember the season when Dirk hurt his knee and it was the Darren Collison, OJ Mayo season? Oh yeah. I um, forget that they had a three game stretch where the team without Dirk shot above <laughs> 60% for yes. three games in a row. The OJ it, Mayo story. <laughs> and he went, we like, thought he was the, he, we thought he was the missing link. We thought he was the second star Dirk always needed for, he for a stretch. No, he is, wasn't. Is the, is the moral of that yeah. story? But I just like I think about things like that because it's just you know you watch enough games, and I think this is some you know this is our problem, you and me specifically, is that we watch every single game, and part of that is because it's our job, and you can tell when these games start to really piss us off because we've seen this show before, and not in meaning tonight, but just like the. And it gets a little tiresome. I mean, there was one person I follow on social media who was like, man, the Matt, like if you're a mass podcaster, you're probably getting tired of talking about the same stuff. It's like, yeah, it's exactly right. But, you know, we all want to talk sports. We all want to figure stuff out. And I don't know. You just got to kind of take the good of the bad. And I think we do a pretty good job of making things short whenever there's nothing to say, or at least there's, you know, kind of the highlights. But it's, it's you know, it, it goes both ways. Like the, the, the sort of frustration that comes out on social media is very evident, but that's why I keep telling everybody to join our green rooms where we have a lot of fun talking and joking and being ridiculous. And that at least for me, I end up feeling a little better than I would if I had just like, like read tweets all night. So, well, yeah. I mean, I'm just, there's so many fun stats. I mean, the Maverick shot 11 of 11 from two point range in the first quarter. 
<laughs> and they shot 12 of 14 in the fourth quarter with all end of bench guys from two. 12 of 14 from your end of the bench on two pointers. Like, seems good. Man, it's hilarious. I can't get over it. I mean, <laughs> this is one of, I mean, up until this game, this is one of the worst offensive Mavericks teams we've watched in some time. And now they're going to go down in the record books as having one of the best offensive performances in franchise history. Mm. Uh, basketball is a weird sport sometimes. Yeah. Well, this is great. Yeah. More, please. All right, guys, Kirk Henderson, Josh Bow, we will be back Friday. For those of you who are kind of curious scheduling-wise, we have the first back-to-back that we've had in a month, which sucks for us <laughs> just because it means more work. On Friday, Saturday, then they play another back-to-back on, I want to say, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we'll probably be recording quick hits after both games, probably not as long, even if they do win or lose, just because, you know, it's just it's the, the content mill. We don't want to, you know, beat it dry. But um, for those of you who have made it this far in the podcast, please keep sending me those Spotify things um, the with the wrap ups. I really love seeing those. Uh, it just it's a nice it, it's just nice to know that people give a shit about what we're doing. And, you know, like I get a ton of, of negative feedback. Like it, sometimes it bounces off me. Sometimes I become a, 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 a whiner, um, as, as those of you have followed me know. And I, it's just really nice to see. My favorite thing was one one guy today who's like, oh, I've listened to 5,200 minutes of, of, of Mavs Moneyball podcast this year, which over 365 days, which I guess it should have been over 330 days because it's only been 11 months. Like that's something like 17 minutes a day of listening to me and Josh and other people. <laughs> which my wife doesn't listen to me for 17 minutes a day. So (laughs) congratulations. I don't know. It's fun. I love it. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Josh, you got anything else before we get out of here? No, uh, just more of that. And I think we will feel, I think our, our brains will feel a lot better as we get closer and closer to Christmas, which feels impossible. So Mm. let's Mm. just get ready for the Pelicans, another Pelicans game. That's right. Okay, guys, Kirk Henderson, Josh Bow, please rate, subscribe, review. Again, send me those those uh, Spotify wrap-ups. I love it. This has been Mavs Moneyball After Dark, and we will talk to you on Friday.